money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. It didn't matter what obstacle she had to remove to get what she wanted. If it was a person, it didn't matter. everybody how y'all doing good to see you here i'm having an off day so we're gonna maneuver around it and i'm not going on camera because i'm don't have makeup on <laughs> and i know that doesn't matter for some people but for me it matters <clears throat> so um today is going to be you know uh, continuance of what we did Sunday, you know, that we discuss difficult things here. This is difficult research. It's not because it's easy. So 
um, this is a trigger warning, a strong trigger warning, because what we are going to go over is really troublesome. It has a lot of sexual, a lot of pervert, uh, perverted sexual content. And it's hard, it's hard to listen to. It's a uh, child abuse and really some sadistic stuff. <laughs> um, but so, I mean, if you are not going to be able to do that, then, you know, here, just this, this one's not for you. And we understand. Uh, just want to say hey to everybody. Hey, Trace. Hey, Gloria. Hey, Beach Bum and Zelda Zelda. And they got the bush. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad y'all are here. Oh, hey, Gloria. If I, I think I said that already. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> hey, hey, Aguilar. How are you? Donna Coggin. I'm glad you're here. Uh, first time I've got to watch you live. Oh, thank you. Um, except I'm not going to be on camera today, but I'm still here live. <laughs> oh, and. Beach Bum, Festus's mom, Dora Pinion, how you doing? Katie H, hey girl. Sandra Massey Hicks, hey. And I was trying to finish watching KJ. Oh, hey, Sue Ellen. Um, but I had to come back here. Um, I slept today. <laughs> today was my day, and I slept so good. I did not want to wake up, but. Anyways, um, thanks for coming, camera or not. <laughs> Thank you, KT. And hey, Denise. Uh, Matt, Matt, I'm just going to say hey, Denise. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my last name growing up was Trahan, uh, which I've heard of, you know, because my brother's name is Dennis Todd Trahan. And Kane, uh, JJ was born as Kanan Todd Trahan. So... Like when KJ would read the book or whatever, she would say Trahan tra or I don't know how they said it. And I'm like, oh, gosh, <laughs> Trahan. <laughs> and if you go 30 miles up north, I'm sorry, to the east where I'm from in Louisiana, it's Trahan. So <laughs> I'm like, whatever. <laughs> it's something. And my first name right there, it it's, usually stops people in their tracks <laughs> when they start, when there's a void of when there's silence or whatever but they're calling roll or something you know i'm like oh that they're trying to figure out how to say my name crush up <laughs> so anyways <clears throat> all right so we are going to I, I mean there are some amazing connections here and it's it's batshit crazy it's batshit crazy i i don't know how else to explain it it just to me by re researching all the stuff that I do like that we've been going over and everything it is um it makes a lot of sense as far as why we're seeing the things that we are seeing <laughs> it doesn't make sense what they're doing it's horrible and it's it's hurting our children um uh, Denise says I just came from a stream Exposing victim survivor exploitation in the child predator catcher community. This is not limited to do the LDS world. This is such the this is the truest statement ever. It's not. It is not. It's everywhere. Um. I just like. I mean, I've I've been victimized of this too when I was younger. Um. It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to do. And it's, I mean, to be, it's a horrible thing to have to go through without having all the words or the emotional tools, you know, to, uh, to even know what's happening or to explain what's happening. A lot of kids just don't even know the words. <laughs> we don't even know what happened and it's bad. And it's not on us, not on us, but it's, it's bad on those that are doing it. And I just don't want to be one to sit here and allow it because it does end up in murder. It does. And I don't know exactly what happened around the time when Tylee and JJ were, were murdered. 
I just know what we know, what we have found out, what what has come forth, and y'all know they're not very forthcoming people. Oh, they're so worried about themselves, and um, you know, so I don't know. I can only imagine. I just I'm highly disturbed at. We don't know if anything happened to Tylee, and that's because they tried to delete her, erase her completely. Um, that there's, I mean, what would they test to find out? JJ, they say it, nothing, you know, happened, but I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am not trust. I don't trust a lot of things now. And I don't know. There's just not a, a lot of um, information around it to make me feel, you know, like it's vetted out properly or that it wouldn't implicate somebody else or who knows, who knows? People do some weird shit and they do bad shit. <laughs> and I mean, gosh, that's why we're here anyways. But all right. So I, what I did find and I've been looking a lot into this investigations and ritual abuse, which is um, <clears throat> a Substack user who goes by go L and this is interesting. Um, it, he goes on to write, let me make sure y'all can see me or see the thing. Yeah. Let me clear my throat. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been taking medicine, you know, cough medicine and allergy medicine, just whatever. I get this. I'm sorry. I'm tired of this throat thingy. It bothers the shit out of me. <laughs> mm, thank you. Yeah. Oh, my daughter was under pressure from a criminal therapist and it was a cult. <laughs> Although I spoke to police. Of it as a gang, 2010. Oh, she was killed. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. But I see you being here and just being proactive and being an advocate and a voice for her. That's very, very honorable. You know, it's hard work. It's difficult. It's difficult research. <laughs> uh, the cult emphasized, right? Uh, that was by chance, too. <laughs> So, mm -hmm. yeah, there was a big cover up and then it continues. I mean, it's been going on since the damn inception of time, you know, beginning of time. Yeah. Destroying evidence. Exactly. Oh, that's what we're here for, Denise. You know, we, that's, that's what we do. It's. It's worth it. They're worth it. And they're, you know, they're not here to tell their stories. So that's our job. I think that's how I feel. <laughs> that's what I've learned through this. And I didn't really ever know that I was looking for my own voice or that I was even, I wasn't looking for my own voice. I was just talking, just, I don't know. I don't even know what I was doing. I still don't a lot of the times, except trying to make sense out of the nonsensical and somewhere along the way I found my voice too which is crazy how I didn't know I was looking for it <laughs> but I don't know it's it's their voice also and it's, it doesn't have an <clears throat> sorry it doesn't have a like I'm not here to um, it's just to bring out things that are around in and around them Oh my gosh. Let me clear my throat. <laughs> Holy. Okay. Let's try this again. <laughs> um, but just the things around. The people that were around them. That their mother was hanging around. Chad. Um, birds of a feather flock together. And... I mean, there's a lot of bad, or yeah, there's a lot of bad people that were around them at that time. I'm, Tim Ballard being one of them. Okay. 
And um, a lot of people don't see where this is connected. <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't been watching it lately, Festus' mom. Like the past two or three, <laughs> I want to say. Yeah. Then you got that out when, yeah. Um, anyways, uh, okay. So the, in an, uh, blah, blah. an interesting thing that I read that, uh, on investigations and ritual abuse by Go L on October 10th, 2023, David Lee Hamblin was a man on the move in the early eighties, a husband and a new father to his daughter, Rachel. He had earned his first graduate degree at Brigham Young University, but he was working for a building develop. I'm sorry, a building developer when he married Roselle Anderson. David and Roselle were both part of the international folk dancers at BYU, and his ties to Provo were through his mother, Mary June Adams. Hamblin at BYU. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Hamblin had grown up in Missouri where his father, Robert, this is a very important link, <laughs> I think so, where his father, Robert, was a professor at Washington University, and Robert's career had taken him westward to the University of Arizona, where he would retire in 1993, after joining the faculty in 1971. Robert Hamblin's educational journey, this is very interesting, had taken his family to Michigan where he earned his PhD in 1955 and then to Missouri where he took a professorship at Washington University in 1957. Much of Hamblin's work in sociology would focus on modifying the behavior of children. That, I mean, ba-boom, I modifying the behavior of children. I was like, what in the hell? <clears throat> Checks out though. They are they training our children? I think I think so. Oh my god, my washer's spinning. <laughs> my cab. The little cabinet's like back, 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 back. <laughs> That's funny. Um it caught me by surprise. Okay. So modifying the behavior of children, his wife, June Adams, who held a master's degree in child development and elementary education, would join him in a laboratory setting where the couple would study the learning experiences of 10 students between the ages of three and five. Right. So these are interesting. I opened these up and I was like, I read the entire thing out loud to Jason. Um, this is U.S. funds sought to improve living habits living habits of the poor here. <laughs> Thank you for praying on us even further. You know, <laughs> Washington university has applied to the housing and urban development department for a $634,354 grant to establish an opportunity house <laughs> for what P P files. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> um, for 60 families in the Yeatman district in and near North St. Louis. The proposed program designed as a demonstration project will be operated by the social exchange laboratories at the university under the direction of Robert L. Hamblin. That's David Hamblin's dad. Modifying children's behavior. <laughs> if money is authorized, and this is the government. Okay. Mm -hmm. If money is authorized, the plan will become part of an overall program of Jeff Vanderloo, Inc. Mm -hmm. Better Living Habits. The plan proposes to each better urban living habits to low-income families. Each family would spend a minimum of 10 weeks in an opportunity house, you know, to have their behavior modified. Mm -hmm. um, I already lost my spot. <laughs> it's so low. Let's see. That pisses me off when I lose my spot. Uh, whatever. Uh, each family would spend a minimum of 10, 10 weeks in the op uh, Opportunity House and another six weeks in outside training. A system of rewards. Now, I this, y'all, made me flash to um, that clip of David Levitt when he's talking about adopting a child and he says about training them like a dog. 
you do it by repetition, by reward. I was, I was like, oh my God, it makes a lot of sense as to why I'm seeing what I'm seeing. And yeah, so a system of rewards for good behavior would provide incentive. Okay. Young children in the families would receive rewards through a food exchange. So we'll work for food, I guess. A child would be given a piece of candy. Well, that's awful. Oh, that's awful. Chipper of them. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if he performed required tasks for older children, a token exchange would be set up. This is so Hitler sounding. <laughs> And I, I don't really know much about it, but it just uh, the general gist of it is just nasty. For older children, a token exchange would be set up. The tokens, uh, which could be turned in for food, toys, and movie admissions would be given for the right behavior. Teenagers and adults would be given credit points, which they could exchange at the end of the day for reduction of rent, furniture, or other household equipment. The project would be divided into nine categories, a cooperative preschool program directed by a teacher and an experimenter uh, would instruct children in basic educational and recreational pursuits for adults and children of school age. There would be remedial study centers in which the participants would be taught remedial reading. I need to go there <laughs> writing and mathematical skills, good health habits, Elemental hygiene, such as brushing teeth and washing the face and hands, would be subject of another phase of the program. Total family participation, so they want the whole family, you know, such as family going together for medical checkups. Ooh, they kind of do that now, you know, like Medicaid and stuff. Anyways, they give you like, you know, I don't know, well baby visits or something. Uh, would earn credit points. Participating families would be trained to function in social situations and deal with community projects. They would be trained in, uh, to participate and cooperate in community meetings. It sounds like Mormon church. Neighborhood projects and social gatherings. After the participants leave Opportunity House to move into permanent quarters, they still would be guided by reward incentives. For example, an apartment inspector for Jeff Vanderloo could reduce the rent of an apartment dweller <clears throat> who has maintained his rooms well. The staff for the Opportunity House would include 20 researchers, four part-time uh, part workers from the Jeff Vanderloo area, two resident directors, two teachers, one nurse and her assistant, a cook and a business manager. Okay. Then here is Karsten. This says Karsten opposes reward plan in teaching good home habits. So this is by David B. Bose, a Washington correspondent of the Post Dispatch. And he questions spending of six hundred and thirty four thousand dollars for Opportunity House here. And it says Washington, May 7, Representative Frank M. Karsten, Democratic St. Louis, has challenged a Washington University proposal to spend federal funds to teach proper living habits to poor under a reward system. It was learned here that as a result of Karsten's question, the Department of Housing and Urban Development held up acquisition. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> held up action on the social science demonstration grant and apparently so notified the applicants. In recent weeks, Carson said HUD or HUD, uh, the Department of Health, Education and Welfare and Office of Economic Opportunity all denied specific knowledge. I wonder why. Nope, didn't have a, nothing to see here, right? Um, of the they they denied knowledge of the application's whereabouts. The social exchange, exchange laboratories at the university's free I'm sorry, at the university requested $634,354 to establish, quote, Opportunity House, unquote, in the Yeatman district of North St. Louis. 60 low-income families would live there for 10-week period, you know, to get trained <laughs> under the auspices of Jeff Vanderloo, Inc. A staff of 30 researchers and resident persons would implement the reward system for brushing their teeth and doing other family tasks. Children would earn credit points towards rent reduction for their parents. In letters to HUD, H-E-W, I guess Hugh, 
and OEO, Carson asked whether the agency wasn't, quote, letting itself in for a lot of criticism and ridicule if projects such as this one were undertaken, unquote. He said the project smacked of Pavlovian experiments to condition the reflexes of laboratory animals. And it does. It reeks. It stinks. Furthermore, Carson told a reporter, quote, scientific curiosity, unquote, about the outcome hardly justifies the spending of federal funds, federal funds, federal funds on the project. Carson said he linked, he, I'm sorry, he liked to think he had brought up his children to do the right things without such in, uh, interference. He wondered also whether children in the experiments would, quote, get extra candy for brushing with fluoridated toothpaste, <laughs> unquote. Okay. An aide to housing secure, uh, secretary, Robert C. Weaver, subsequently notified Carson that HUD had the St. Louis request. Carson said he was told that HUD officials had lumped the application with another for joint consideration. Okay. I mean, just an OEO, I can't really read it all, but after noting that the agency knew nothing of the matter, thanked Carsten, and I don't know. <laughs> but there's Robert C., uh, Robert L. Hamblin's name right there, okay, at the very bottom in the yellow. Okay, so Daddy, that's what Daddy did, and so Daddy brought that shit home, <laughs> okay? And so now everybody's got to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, asshole. <laughs> Because, I mean, Jody's doing this. She is training kids. She's training kids. These, these people, Ruby is sending her kids to trainers. That's, that's what I'm gathering from it. I'm alleging that. That's where I'm at. And I don't know who else. You know, I mean, God only knows. And then that's when this whole up is down, down is up <laughs> comes in. It's weird. Nine on faculty promoted by Washington U. Nine Washington University faculty members have been promoted, including two to the rank of professor. Chancellor Ethan Shepley announced Sunday. Promoted to the rank of professor are Leslie Chabay, I don't know, Clayton Music, and James McKelvey. Um, Clayton Chemical Engineering. Okay. Four faculty members have been promoted to an associate professor. They are Robert L. Hamblin. Okay. This is, this is a, David Hamblin's dad, uh, 408 Alta Dina Court, University City Sociology, Ology, <laughs> Robert Montgomery, 6324 Northwood. Okay, let's see. All right, that's about it. Um, here he is. Professor Robert L. Hamblin, named to new Washington U Post. Let's see what this one says. Okay. Professor Robert L. Hamblin will succeed Albert F. Wesson as chairman of the Department of Sociology and uh, Anthropology at Washington University. Wesson has been granted leave to teach in England. A graduate of the University of Utah, Hamblin also studied at the University of Michigan. Before joining Washington University faculty in 1957, he taught in the Samoan islands at yeah and at iowa state university he became a professor in 1964 and has participated in research projects related to juvenile delinquency hmm. you don't say so over those 10 years Tam, uh, hamblin's focus on juveniles and behavior modification for children would give him an overlap with the academic focus of none other than dr clyde everett sullivan who would become his in-law when David Lee Hamblin married Roselle Anderson. Okay. Robert Lee Hamblin's life as the father of Carol, David, Kristen, Suki, and Stephen Hamblin was moving along nicely at 408 Alta Dina Court in University City. Okay. Right here. Um, he, was he was a credible academic whose relentless grant and study proposals had yielded dividends in the form of a department chair 10 years into his career. It would not last a year. In July of 68, Hamblin's resignation would expose a rift between the sociology faculty and Washington University's administration. Okay, so right here, uh, I can read this. Um, I didn't really, I, I, I grazed over it. Uh, 
but I like read his dissertation, uh, actually Robert Hamblin's dissertation. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And it is, that's what they're doing. They are trying to find ways of training kids. Okay. Robert Lee Hamblin's chairmanship was over, but his professorship would continue for three additional years. His prospects at Washington university were demolished. The central controversy was the dissertation of R.A. Laud Humphreys, who posed as a watch queen. Okay. This is, I guess, like an undercover thing <laughs> for men seeking anonymous sex with other men in public restrooms. There it is. <laughs> Humphreys offered his services as a lookout for the police so that men having sex in the public restroom could have advance warning, you know, a caca, <laughs> if the police were to show up. Humphreys took down the license plates of those men using that information. Now here, you're going to feel, you're going to get the whole ethics thing right here. <laughs> it's so horrible. So he took their license plates down, right? And he used that information to identify them and solicit them as research subjects. Like, hey, can we research you? Humphreys claimed that 38% of his subjects were not homosexual or bisexual, even though they were meeting other men in a, uh, even though they were meeting other men for sex in public restrooms. <laughs> he identified himself as a health service researcher instead of disclosing that he was a graduate student engaged in research for his dissertation. Humphreys did not procure his subjects uh, consent in advance. So he didn't get there. He didn't ask them in advance. Instead, he identified them and approached them later to solicit their participation in interviews. Okay, <clears throat> this was a clear ethical breach. And when the topic and methods utilized in his dissertation became known, the chancellor of Washington University sought to rescind Humphrey's doctorate. Humphrey's had been married since 1960, but in 1974, he would come out as a gay man. He did not separate from his wife until 1980 when he began living with a graduate student. This was the type of research that was uh, taking place while Robert Lee Hamblin was the department chair. And it cost him the confidence of his dean. Humphreys argued that anonymous sexual encounters between men in bathrooms were harmless and sought to normalize the encounters. God forbid they normalized this shit. <laughs> Robert Lee Hamblin had presided over a department that seemed perfectly fine with eth ethical breaches which enabled Humphreys to lie to research subjects, track down their real identities through their license plate numbers, and approach them afterwards to solicit their participation in his dissertation research in a manner that could have easily been interpreted as extortion, given the real dangers for gay men in the 1960s. It is clear that Humphreys was not merely a researcher or a graduate student, he was a closeted gay man using the cover of academia to argue that anonymous gay sex in public restrooms was harmless and therefore worthy of destigmatization. The fact that his department chairman was an active endowed member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who knew or should have known what Humphreys was doing is even more appalling. And this is not me writing it. I'm just reading. Um, even if Robert Lee Hamblin didn't object on moral grounds, he should have put a stop to Humphrey's research on ethical grounds due to Humphrey's lying to subjects, failing to secure their consent in advance and the clear privacy breaches Humphrey's committed. Hamblin did nothing and it cost him his chairmanship. Yeah, well, see something, say something. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. All right. So it says in the context of his granddaughter's allegations, Robert Lee Hamblin's failure to act. Oh, see, so he did. He saw something and didn't say something. Where Laud Humphreys was concerned. I'm sorry. Where Laud Humphreys was concerned is consistent with what Rachel Hamblin and her sisters allege. The Hamblin victims' statements explicitly outline homosexual conduct between David Lee Hamblin, David, 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 and Craig Christensen. And make it clear that homosexual conduct among the women of the LDS Church of Satan was widespread in the 80s and 90s, even as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was publicly battling against gay marriage. It's so weird because how are they in contact with like 
apostles, uh, M. Russell Ballard, and how are they? There's a few more. And then the prophet at the time was Hinckley. He was in and out of there. What What is really going on? <laughs> you know, I think it's a lot of projection. I don't know what's going on outside. Or if Jason's doing something. <laughs> okay, it must be in the kitchen. It sounded weird. Okay. And it says, to, uh, today, alleged LDS Church of Satan Punisher, Joe Binion's Horseshoe Mountain Pottery, displays a pride flag in the window. Robert Lee Hamblin was willing to put his academic career on the line in the 60s to enable Laud Humphreys to engage in research methodology and a dissertation topic that was far outside of what would be considered in academia at the time. He was also willing to risk ex uh, public exposure that could have led to church discipline as a Latter-day Saint. Given the allegations against Robert Lee Hamblin by his granddaughters, which detail his own conditioning of David Lee Hamblin, his son, and his siblings for incestuous sexual contact between parents and children's and siblings. The fact that Robert Lee Hamblin had access to children in research settings is even more troubling. I'd say it's the most troubling. During the time, he would have been training his own children, Carol, David, Kristen, Suki, and Stephen Hamblin, to comply with the LDS Church of Satan's sexual practices, grr, are his own daughters and teaching his sons that they were entitled to sexual dominion over their sisters. Robert and June Hamblin were conducting studies on children as young as three years of age. I mean, just think about that. Crap. <clears throat> so sorry. I, if I could mute it, I'm on this side though, and I can't, so I'd have to go back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> um, their subjects were drawn from extremely young children Poor families, juvenile delinquents. Think about Chad Frankie and going to Anastasi. And I mean, that's that's where I go. I'm like, uh uh. uh. uh <clears throat> and like, didn't Jody come from like a family of nothing but boys? I want to say. Okay. So as young as three, um, there's, okay, where am I at? <laughs> okay, their subjects were drawn from extremely young children, poor families, juvenile delinquents, and other pools of individuals whose accusations of wrongdoing would have likely been dismissed with ease. Robert Lee Hamblin would have had a hunting grounds to himself, and plus he was trained, right? And he would have had the ability to offer his own children in sexual trades to compromise his fellow academics and others who might have opposed him. This kind of compromise operation was detailed by Robert's granddaughters, who alleged that their parents offered them in sexual trade to people within the Ch Church of Satan and outside of the Church of Satan. The child pornography films David Lee Hamblin produced with his daughters and friends were offered for sale out of a video rental store in Mount Pleasant. I really wonder if this is where uh, M. Russell Ballard had in the church had funded $20 million to Gordon Hannibal Lecter, dude. Okay. He, he's like a Hannibal Lecter, Gordon Bowen. Um, Cause it, he was supposed to be making a movie and that movie has not come out. <laughs> then uh, I'm sure it has just, uh, uh. Anyways, um, his academic career with Washington University was clearly over. Um, Robert Lee Hamblin was forced to consider other options, and he found his next position at the University of Arizona. You know, got to go down there. Mormondor. Okay, the Hamblin movie, um, the Hamblin movie. The Hamblin family moved to Arizona in 1971 and settled in at 70 uh, Cali Encanto. I don't know. A home tucked away in a neighborhood ensconded in a circular street layout. To the north, East Cali Clara Vista eventually turned into East Cali Beleza. Y'all don't pick on me. In the south, 
The neighborhood had access roads from East Fifth Street and East Broadway Boulevard, as well as North Country Club Road. But it wasn't not it was not otherwise accessible from Guano Way, the road that ran down the eastern border of the community wall. Okay. There you go. All right. Just might as well put a bullseye right there. <laughs> Make that a dartboard. It's target practice. Okay. For a group like the Church of Satan, the neighborhood surrounding Encanto Circle uh, was secluded and offered privacy for those who wished to be tucked away from scrutiny. Robert Lee Hamblin start, started anew in his academic career at the University of Arizona. So David's dad, he, he starts, a, you know, right there, but it, it ended almost immediately, right? Hamblin ran into trouble. He had hired Philip G. Ga uh, Vargas, a uh, Harvard Law student. Uh, my gosh. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Let me try this again. <laughs> he had hired Philip G. Vargas, a Harvard Law School, oh my God, a Harvard Law School graduate, offering him a one year contract as an assistant professor. Four white assistant professors hired at the same time as Vargas were given three year contracts. That sounds, that sounds like there's about to be some race. <laughs> uh, yeah, racist stuff okay which robert l hamlin defended as justified based on their qualifications two of the assistant professors like vargas did not have phds in sociology and hamlin admitted that he on he had only hired vargas because of pressure mexican-american students exerted on the university administration okay vargas sued right through the equal opportunity i'm sorry e okay this eeoc <laughs> He left at the end of 74, accepting a one-year fellowship with the Drug Abuse Council. He was the only professor of 202 hired in 1973 who was Mexican-American. Or Latin-American. Or what is it? Uh, I went blank all of a sudden. Vargas was not the only disgruntled faculty member in Hamblin's department. Frank A. Petroni also sued the University of Arizona in 1974 claiming that Hamblin and UA Vice President Albert B. Weaver had overridden a faculty vote of 11 to 2 to deny tenure to Petroni, while also defaming him, shocker, by characterizing his published articles as material for second- or third-rate journals. <laughs> Sting. <laughs> Burn. So childish. Uh, it's, it's just nothing but a fight for control and power. Really, in my opinion, <clears throat> Hamblin claimed that he had instituted a publish or parish standard in the department designated to catapult UA sociology department into the top 10 nationally. He did attract he did attract grants to study the spread of violence, claiming that he could mathematically model such matters. The deeper question was how Robert Lee Hamblin managed i'm sorry managed to go from a deposed department head at washington university to the incoming department head at the university of arizona but he retired uh, before he retired hamblin would uh would court additional controversy he used the personal experiences of <laughs> he used the freaking personal experiences of student elizabeth l burns what a what a douche disclosed in a classroom assignment in a pair of his in a pair of his books and during his in-class lectures, Hamblin never notified Burns in advance, nor did he secure her consent. 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 You see the, the theme here? Mm -mm. He simply referenced Burns by name to her fellow students when lecturing and put her writing in his books. <laughs> okay? I'm just going to damn take it, is what he did. Against the backdrop of the Lord Humphrey matter, Robert Lee Hamblin's actions were consistent with a career long disregard for the norms and ethics of social science and research and writing. Wherever he went, controversy followed. If Robert Lee Hamblin's granddaughters are telling the truth, his private home life was oriented towards training his sons to abuse their own sisters. 
sounds about right, don't it? For them. Um, that abused. Let me finish this. Okay. That abuse carried over into adulthood as Suki and Cree Hamblin allegedly carried on incestuous sexual relationships with their brother, David Hamblin, during the CS's 80s and 90s activity in Provo and Spring City. Craig and Suki Christensen had followed David and Roselle Hamblin east to New York City in the 80s. Oh my gosh, come on, this is long. I just figured this was very important because it it explains the backdrop, you know, of why we are here and why we're going to listen to the rest of the, or some of that, some more of that presentation of the abuse, right? David Lee Hamblin had taken his, this is New York, New York. David Lee Hamblin had taken his family down to Arizona in the early 80s while he completed his graduate work towards a, doctor, a doctorate. While there, Hamblin and his wife, Roselle, took up the cause of food for Poland, and they appeared in numerous newspaper articles covering the cause. They were listed as the Arizona Coordinators of Food for Poland in a March 1982 letter to the editor appearing in the Arizona Daily Star. He had completed his master's degree in August of 83, and then he had taken his undertaken his doctorate level work. Hamblin's dissertation was chilling. He examined value convergence or the idea that, quote, successful psychotherapy patients adopt their therapist's values. Bam. <laughs> okay. In the context of his daughters and his patients' allegations, Hamblin's efforts towards value convergence were as follows. So this is what he like did. Okay. With patient Brett Bluth, Okay, that's that guy that uh, shared that news article or that video about from Fox 13 News. Um, inducing the notion that childhood ritual abuse memories had been recovered under hypnosis. That's what Robert, I mean, uh, David Hamblin told Brett Bluth. This is his, this is his, his uh, patient, okay. And okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay, and that the ritual abuse was the cause of Bluth's homosexuality. Bluth denied being under a hypnotic state, stating that he was conscious during his his, his sessions with Hamblin, and he disputed Hamblin's asserta um, sorry assertions that he had revealed childhood ritual abuse. Hamblin countered by telling Bluth that if he did not relent and accept Hamblin's narrative, okay, oh my God, that um he would remain a homosexual. This culminated in Hamblin convincing Bluth that the only way Bluth would overcome his homosexuality was the ingestion of semen from a righteous man <clears throat> to drive out the semen of Bluth's purported child abusers, childhood abusers. When Bluth talked to other patients in Hamblin's practice, he realized that Hamblin was using the same techniques on those patients and he decided to confront Hamblin. Good for him. With his daughters, inducing the notion that girls, even at the age of infancy, okay, this is what's wrong with people, beguile and tempt men. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Sorry. Thereby displacing culpability from the men for sexually assaulting children to the children themselves. So it's their fault, okay? It's, it's the woman's fault for wearing a skirt. It's their fault. It's victim blaming <laughs> With all his patients articulating a mixture of theories that combined Native American beliefs with Latter-day Saint priesthood blessings. Them fuck. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoa, I was about to say the F word. <laughs> Freaking blessings, right? Keep them. We're good. Don't bless us. <laughs> Speaking for myself, I guess. Um, okay. As well as Hamblin's own, quote, parts theory, unquote whereby Hamblin could use the priesthood power he held as a Latter-day Saint mm -mm, to cut off desired parts from his patient's psyches, while also utilizing peyote as a therapeutic drug. Hamblin additionally sought to convince his patients that sexual contact with him was just part of their therapy. Okay. <laughs> Hamblin explicitly conditioned recovery on compliance with his methods and total acceptance of the values underlying those methods. 
his patients desperate to overcome homosexuality, depression, anxiety, and dissociative identity disorder or DID generally went along with this method methodology and did not question him until much later. When David Lee Hamblin took his family eastward to Port Chester, New York, he and his wife Roselle set up his household at 77 Terrain Avenue, a house divided into several apartments. Rachel Hamblin alleged that the landlord of 77 Terrain Avenue was the local Church of Satan Punisher who carried out the group's torture in the basement of the building. What the hell? She and her sisters, this is Roselle, she and her sisters were subjected to that torture and forced to watch other children receive electroshock therapy and other forms of abuse. Okay, and so they, he added this right here. Uh, redacted shows homes where they were safe or safer to practice their religion. New York landlord and neighbor were CS members. Provo, our neighbor was Cliffany. <laughs> An old lady who redacted told us was going senile. Spring City, our house and lot was very surrounded by an abandoned lot, the Binions, and an old lady, Bernice, who was very hard of hearing and sat inside with her TV blaring 24-7. The neighbor, Jeff Allred, who lived to the west of us, was almost one full acre away from our house and had a large closed fence around his property around his property line redacted often said things about him being stupid and and called him an alcoholic on the other side of our same block lived an old lady i'm sorry an old nearly blind artist named ella peacock next to ella was linda allred and sometimes her daughter bobette okay <laughs> weird names and son-in-law redacted said bobette and husband were ritual abusers when redacted was of age to attend their nursery, uh, to attend their nursery class in the LDS church, I was told the family on the north end of the Binion side of the street hated us, especially the Binions. When a neighbor, a quote neighbor, called the cops on our family for the frequent noise and bonfires outside, everyone said it must have been a complaint from this certain family. In places we lived there were LDS ward and stake members around us that were secretly CS members. So this is a whole network. Okay. <laughs> Freaks. Assholes. Okay. In a neighborhood near you, right? Wherever the Hamblins moved, they chose residents in neighborhoods where the CS had an existing presence. Okay. New York was no different than Utah or Arizona. David Lee Hamblin took his family to a neighborhood where their home would be located at the end of a street right before a circular cul-de-sac. The neighbor, oh my God, I'm tired of reading. The neighborhood Robert Lee Hamblin resided in during the early 70s featured the same cul-de-sac model. Grandview Avenue and Terrain Avenue were the only ones into the block that the Hamblins lived on. They were secluded, free to practice their beliefs in an apartment dominated by the CS. There were three key locations outside of their residence for the Hamblin family during their time in Port Chester, New York. The first was David Lee Hamblin's internship at Cornell Medical Center, West Chester Division in White Plains, New York. The second was the only meeting house in South West Chester at the time at 60 Wayside Lane in Scarsdale. The final location was David Lee Hamblin's employer at Samaritan Counseling, located at 2 Milton Road in Rye, New York. And so there's this, and you can maybe take a screenshot or something. That's him right there. And I can't read that anyways if I try it. <laughs> it's blurry. Okay. David Lee Hamblin taught seminary at the ward in Scarsdale for two years. 1986 and 87 he had access to the high school youth in his capacity as brother hamblin seminary teacher according to his daughters david lee hamblin was active member of the c of the cs during that time he was engaged in the daily sexual physical and psychological abuse of his young children and rachel would have been no older than seven during this time eliza it's another daughter would have been merely four years old and Katie would have been just two years old in his capacity as a graduate student 
training to become a psychologist, he had access to vulnerable individuals at both Cornell Medical Center and Samaritan Counseling. I would say, and at church, okay? <laughs> and his neighborhood, just at large. The question of why David Lee Hamblin chose Port Chester and the surrounding area for his graduate internship is likely answered by the presence of his uncle and uh, his uncle-in-law, Clyde Everett Sullivan, in Scarsdale during the 60s and 70s. The Sullivan Anderson connected, I'm sorry, connection to Scarsdale. In December of 1969, Richard Lloyd Anderson and his wife Karma made the decision to ship their this sounds so familiar, okay? To ship their daughter, Roselle, which she's she's one of the uh she she got arrested, you know. So that's Hamblin's wife, ex-wife now. Okay, but they shipped her off. It sounds to me just like Jesse. How Jesse's parents just went and just dropped dropped her off at uh or dropped uh get I, I mess up with the pronouns, okay? Dropped them off, dropped her off at her Aunt Jody's. It just sounds so <sighs> copy paste, copy paste. And I'm sure that's what um Ru uh, what Ruby and Kevin Frankie did with Chad, you know, when they dropped him off at Anasasi and whatever, you know. They're trying to train their kids and her little one, the, uh, their initials R and E, um, you know, R escaped from Jody's and ran to the neighbors. And I mean, that's what, I think that's what was going on. I really do. She was training them. Uh, <clears throat> in December of 1969, Richard Allen I'm sorry, Richard Lloyd Anderson and his wife, Karma, made the decision to ship their daughter, Roselle, east to Scarsdale, New York, in the middle of her senior year of high school. Huh. Roselle would finish her high school education while living with her uncle Clyde in Aunt Nola. Roselle Anderson had been active in extracurricular activities in the late 60s, playing recorder and piano in various groups, including Ars Pro Gaudio, where she would perform with Michael Nibley, <laughs> here we go, son of accused ritual abuser and BYU professor Hugh Nibley. Uh, his, I want to say it was his stepdaughter, or maybe, I don't remember, uh, Martha Beck, okay. She wrote a book. She was a, a psycho, uh, she was in mental, uh, in the mental health field. Also, her piano teacher was none other than Francine Binion, the aunt of C.S. Spring City Punisher, Joe Binion. Okay. Oh, I did this wrong. This one first. And then this one. Oh, Boy Scouts. Jesus Christ. Mm. It's just horrible. We have, we have failed. <laughs> we have failed. In Missouri, her future husband, David, was earning designation as an Eagle Scout. Mm, wonder where he got it from. He didn't have, he didn't stand a chance. He had a dad and a mom uh, who, or no, I, I don't remember now. The mom, I think his mom was a teacher. Or was she into that? Uh, she was also a psychiatrist too. I don't remember just that short ago. <laughs> My short-term memory sucks. Um, either way, either way. Um, there was no obvious reason for Roselle to go eastward midway through her senior year of high school, but her parents sent her nonetheless. Contextual clues in the victim statements written by her daughters may give insight into why she was sent to live with Clyde and Nola Su uh, Sullivan in 1970 and finishing her high school career. And it says, oh, I didn't, oh, I just clicked it and it clicked me out of there. <laughs> I want to go back. Okay. When we were little, Redacted would put us in redacted thicker shirts or sweaters and bind our arms across ourselves and tie the ends behind us just like a stray jacket then they would torture and abuse us while we were bound later they got an actual white stray jacket it was used at our house and brought on trips i had been told when I was very small, that Redacted had gone to the mental hospital to rest after Redacted was born. Redacted and other family would speak sometimes of the several 
Times Redacted had, quote, run away and been institutionalized in her life. The same people spoke about Redacted Bonnie, Redacted's niece, his sister's daughter. She was very kind to us and told us about how she had been, quote, put away for a while in a, men a mental institution after repeated breakdowns. Mm -mm. The significance of Clyde Sullivan's presence in Scarsdale cannot be overstated. Sullivan was an alleged CS member working as a clinical psychologist in New York from the 60s into the mid-70s at least, and he was located in the same city as the meeting house and ward where his nephew-in-law, David Lee Hamlin, would serve as a seminary teacher in 1986 and 1987. The meeting house in question is secluded from other meeting houses in the area and drew from a wide geographic area as a result. The meeting house at 60 Wayside Lane in Scarsdale is 20 minutes from David Lee Hamblin's old apartment in Port Chester, but it was just nine minutes from Clyde Sullivan's home at 128 Moreland Drive in Scarsdale. And so he, he left some, some photos of the home and neighborhood. Okay. This is Miss Noella. I'm sorry, Miss Noelle Sullivan, Sarah Udall. The Mormon Temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, was a setting December 17th for marriage of Sarah Udall and Noel Clyde Sullivan. The bride is the daughter of Dr. and Mrs. Addison Udall of Merced, California. The bridegroom is the son of Dr. and Mrs. Clyde E. Sullivan of Moreland Drive. I'm sorry, I'm having a bend low. Scarsdale, Mrs. Sullivan graduated from Merced High School. She is attending Brigham Young University uh, School of Nursing, from which she expects to graduate this April. Okay. Her husband graduated from New York State University at Buffalo and expects to complete bra uh, blah, blah, blah. expects to complete graduate work in the MBA program at Brigham Young University. Okay. Navy, blah, blah, blah. I can't really see. <clears throat> given the allegations that the Hamblin children making their victim in, uh, their victim statements, it is likely that both Robert Lee Hamblin and Clyde Everett Sullivan sought out locations where they, as CS members, could be safe to practice their beliefs without interference. Their known residences should be scrutinized due to these factors. The five addresses in question would require a trip of merely 50 minutes. And so you like start here or I don't know. Just either way. This is like a beaten path, right? Okay, so the conclusion is, given the facts and the allegations within the Hamblin victim statements, it is more likely than not that CS groups operated within Scarsdale, New York, Port Chester, New York, Tucson, Arizona, and University City, Missouri, during the time frames that Joe, uh, I'm sorry, that Robert Lee Hamblin Clyde Everett Sullivan and David Lee Hamblin were located in those areas. Okay. And so that's the rest is just, uh, you know, asking for like how much he pays out and, and subscribers and stuff. And I mean, I urge you to go and, and do that investigations and ritual, ritual abuse uh, on Substack. And anyways, I'll, I'll leave it in just a minute. I'm not over there right now. So I know that's heavy. If that's not heavy, that's actually the lighter part. <laughs> this is actually the lighter part. But isn't that crazy? I think so. I think I think they're nuts. <laughs> I think they're nuts. And I I think it's you know they pick these places, and they they do they pick these places and they pick their victims and. It's just bad. It's just bad. It's bad, bad. Everybody's doing okay? Mod squad, my cell phone has died, so I will not get any messages for a minute. Okay. Um. All right. Let me go over to this one. I'm going to try and use the... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Shush. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and use this, and maybe it'll be louder. I, it just was not... Um, loud at all. I hope it makes a difference. 
were two adult female patients who testified at trial. I don't know where we left Each off. Each suffered sorry. significant emotional trauma as a result of their experiences. I need to get over the there. Petitioner and Petitioner <laughs> never contacted them to apologize for his actions. So what you have here is by 1999 and 2000, it is known that David Lee Hamlin, as a psychologist, is having sex with his patients and trying to convince them that it's part of their therapy. Mm-mm. He's stripped of his license, but he's not charged with any crime. So hmm. at the time when his daughters are walking into like the Jody. Provo Police Department, 1999 to 2000, it's known that he's had sex with his patients. Do y'all know where we were at the last one? The I don't. Is part of the therapy. <laughs> I just kind of started Despite it here. This, the Provo Police Department, the Utah County Attorney's Office, declined to investigate further or prosecute him. There is more. There's always more. <laughs> Rachel, Eliza, and Katie Hamlin alleged that their father, David Lee Hamlin, had moved a patient named Angela Fenton into the family's home in Provo. Angela Fenton was a dissociative identity disorder patient with multiple personalities, one of whom was a young boy named CJ. David Lee Hamlin had sex with Angela Fenton and involved Rachel in therapy sessions with Fenton. He represented to Rachel and to others that she was his apprentice, even though she was a child with no psychological training whatsoever. Rachel Hamlin alleged that she was abused by her father and Angela Fenton. This is from the divorce proceedings. Exactly. <laughs> During the course of the marriage, a female patient, here and after referred to as the patient, mm-hmm. as part of her therapy, came to live in the family home with the parties and their minor children. While the patient was living with as you can as you can hear the same cycle being repeated. So now David Hamblin and actually this girl CJ, or who's going by CJ. Um I forget her real freaking name. Um let me find it. She's the patient and she was referred by her freaking stake president. Okay. She was referred by her stake president in the LDS church who sent her to David Hamblin. He became her patient. He, she became his patient. And then the both of them allegedly um, took, they partook of their incestuous crap. Okay. This is really gross. It's so, it's so triggering to me. It sounds just like Jody. God. And I wonder about Tom Harrison, y'all. D- Tim Ballard. He named him. And that's where the whole pheromones crap came from. Tom, uh, Tom Harrison, who wrote, who's behind visions of glory. Okay. And that's the, that he spoke with David Hamblin, like they were speakers on the circuit and everything uh, for a long time. They're, you know, they go way back and I find it alarming. OK, I just um, I never did trust. And that's the connection right there. Of the petitioner and his family in their home in Provo, Utah, the petitioner was performing therapy on the patient who was suffering from severe mental disorders including but not limited to multiple personality disorder. While the patient was living with Petitioner and his family in their home in Provo, Utah, Petitioner involved Rachel, who was a minor at the time, in therapy sessions with the patient. Petitioner neglected his wife and children in order to devote time to the patient and ultimately had sexual contact with the patient while she was still residing in his home. The above identified confusing mixture of multiple religious and psychological theories and practices created an environment which has caused extreme mental and emotional damage and instability in the lives of Rachel, Eliza, and Katie. You think? <laughs> Big time. There Angela she is. Angela Fenton. This is Angela Fenton of Apply Synergies, where she serves as the Human Resources Director for her former bishop and stake president, Conrad Godfordson. Okay. That's the guy who sent her. He's the stake president. He sent her, allegedly, to be seen as a patient, a uh, client by David Hamblin. Mm-hmm. According to Rachel Hamblin, Angela Fenton is a member of a Church of Satan family from Alpine, Utah. Okay, so let, this might be a good time to, because we haven't even brought this up. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what we're going to be discussing today is... Um, Horrible. The Church of Satan. Well, the LDS Church of Satan. A lot of people are uncomfortable, right? So I think that's why the 
whole the church of Satan thing is important, I guess, to some people. <clears throat> I see it just as something within that's existing within, you know, the church and churches. It's everywhere. It's in every religion, every everything. It's everywhere. And and so I guess it helps people feel comfortable being a part of the same organization. I don't know. I don't know if that's just a, a defense mechanism or what. Kind of like I don't like the labels. That's that's me. So think of it as a religion within the religion. I think I already did show your average Latter Day Saint is not going to be privy to this. Um, they're going to go to sacrament meetings. I did. So we're going to scooch up to here, okay? The victim statements. So we're going to go right now into the High Council ceremony that excommunicated David Lee Hamlin in 1999. This is going to be bad. It was evening when David and uh, Rosie told me that we would be going before uh, Richard Lloyd Anderson's High Council that night. I tried to ask her questions about it, but she would only say that Aunt Suki and Uncle Craig would be there, as well as many friends and neighbors, and that uh, Rosie and David were driving separately. Rosie told me I was to wear my maroon and lace, uh, black lace dress, but no underwear. She mm -hmm. ordered us to shower and prepare our bodies to participate in whatever was coming. We all rode in the car, and she made us wear blindfolds. We drove for a little while and parked. And by the way, I really, this is what I pictured, just minus all the sadistic stuff, um, for Tylee and JJ. So... I think Melanie and David showed up to attend. Okay. That that's it. I, I can't get that out of my head. It's I'm don't want to be drawn to it, but this is <laughs> this is it. People helped us get out of the car and we walked a ways and then we were led downstairs before we got into the room. Then we were ordered to take off the blindfolds. The room looked like a basement room, maybe a private home or a church. Hmm. David was already there and Richard was at a long table in his role as the peacemaker. The other elders were there at the table wearing graduation robes or dark robes. So the graduation robes, she's, you know, it's like she's a victim trying to explain that. So when you really think about that, it's so, oh my God, these poor kids. Flash cloaks and mask. Other people. And it reminds me of the graduation mask. robes or dark robes slash cloaks and mask. Other mm -hmm. people's dress and robes and masks were seated all around the room as well. We pause for a second. Secret societies. It always seems like there's there's God's order and the way he does things, and mm -hmm. there's Satan's counterfeit. God's priesthood, Satan's priesthood. God's um, ordinances and Satan's ordinances. And to me, this, you know, if it, it's it's I, I see the... Uh, counter of this incredible especially as you continue to go here if and, you studied, and it is dark as much as light is light mm -hmm. dark is just as dark mm -hmm. yeah, if you study the occult in particular most satanist groups like what they thrive on is to invert like mm -hmm. christian rights or ordinances Truth. and they're going to invert them and turn, turn them on their head it's no different here i mean basically nope. this high council proceeding is like a church court but for the lds church of satan so richard <laughs> or David was there already and Richard was at a long table in his role as a peacemaker. Mm -mm -mm. Richard didn't have a mask on. They opened the meeting with prayer and acknowledged every council member by their title. By the way, if you have kids, this is a good time to move them out. A long time ago. <laughs> the beginning of the show was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're a little late on that. Disclaimer again, though, on this part. Yeah. You're going to be investing some serious money in therapy. Mm. Um, and then David was brought forward. Richard spoke harshly to David for a long time about the consequences of his reckless behavior, his narcissism and putting himself above the leadership of the church, church of Satan, and for endangering the Lord's Lucifer's work on the earth. Richard said that the council had decided that David was to take the fall. The custody trial would move forward and Eliza and I would be permitted to speak about some molestation by him. Mm -hmm. Eliza and I would be permitted to speak about some molestation by him. No mention of Rosie or any others would be permitted. He said all participants in the trial would be approved by the council and it would never go to a criminal trial. Then he reprimanded Rosie, reprimanded Rosie for not bringing David's actions to the council and for going along with him. 
The council then voted to revoke David's position as Peter Familius over Rosie and our family, and that authority was transferred to Richard. David's face was set and grim. Then Richard called me up and said he was reminding me that as the peacemaker, it was my sworn duty to follow and enforce the council's commands among the family. They said if I did anything more or different than what had been decided, and explained that I would be violating my covenants, my birthright would be revoked, or my title role as a peacemaker. Is that the same as a namesake? A birthright? I remember Summer saying that her son was Tylee's namesake, and I was like, that's weird. What is that? I remember looking it up, and I just don't, I don't know. Just kind of pinged on my radar. And I would be cut off eternally from my bloodline, and I would be turned over to the Punisher, Gordon Bowen. You're going to hear Ugh. a lot about Gordon Hannibal Bowen. Lecter. If you do not know who he is. Well, put a pin in it. Yeah, put a pin in that. You will know who he yeah. is. He said there would be no restrictions on what the Punisher did to me, and they could easily cover up my murder. He said similar things. Ooh, that sounds like what, um, that sounds like what Lori said to Uncle Charles. You know, that she would have an angel there to dispose of his body or whatever. Just point out the things that are similar. To Eliza, and he spoke to Katie, too. So you're hearing a lot of words that we haven't brought up, and I know a lot of this is new just to begin with, but we've mentioned things like peacemakers and punishers. So those are roles within the LDS Church of Satan? See, and I think it's just within the church, and it pulls all the people like, come follow me, come follow me, hear him, see him, know him. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. That's where that comes in for me. And that's where I correlate. <clears throat> and the whole monkey thing, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> I don't know. It, it just, I think it's just within the church. I think they're just saying church of Satan to, uh, I don't know, distance themselves or, I don't know. Um, David Lee, David Levitt was the conspirator. His task was to, and this is a turn. So David Lee, I'm sorry, David Levitt. He's the one that talked about, um, he's the one that has the house in Scotland or the castle. I'm sorry, the castle. Yeah. He has a whole damn castle in Scotland. And uh, he was on uh, Fox 13 news investigates by Adam Herbert as saying when he was, uh, uh, when he was referencing uh, adopting a child and, he was talking about how you train them just like you train a dog, you know, by repetition and reward, you know, holy crap. Same way you train a kid. Basically, that's what he's saying. Ooh. Was the conspirator. His task was to. And this is attorney. This is attorney David Lee, David Levitt, who is the former Utah County attorney and the former Juab County attorney. His job was to attack anybody who threatened the CS's interest. So we had to repeat oaths and demonstrate our commitment to Satan and his church. Oh, we oh. Were... Mm. So I was kind of Googling everybody's names, right? And then I fell asleep. So I didn't, I don't have it here to show you, but I can tell you uh, right here, Joy Lundberg and Gary Hansen. Okay. There's Joy and Gary Lundberg also. Well, I looked their names up and they have produced their therapist. He's a therapist. Gary Lundberg is a therapist. And he wrote, he and his wife, Joy Lundberg, wrote an article that was on East Idaho News um, in 2015. And I mean, it was just featured uh, for giving marital advice on what to do with a blended family, how to deal with a blended family. So it's very much a part of, of our story and a part of society. You know, there's these people doing this allegedly in the, in the dark. And then here we are unsuspecting and, and they're amongst us in society. It's so troublesome. So we had to repeat oaths and demonstrate our commitment to Satan and his church. <laughs> We were ordered to stand nude in a circle and rub the genitals of the person next to us. And everyone had to take turns Ugh. giving Richard oral sex. He mm -hmm. made a point to ejaculate on my sister. And I was sure that David was going to punch him. Richard told him to drink the semen and he refused. Oh my God. Rosie started licking it off of Richard instead. Then people around the room came over and made 
Eliza and I do physical and sexual things. I was forced to give oral sex to a man. Some people's masks came off in the orgy, and I saw Joy Lundberg and Gary Hansen. Hmm. When it was over, we were told to dress and put our blindfolds on for our trip home. Note, I came a little too close in some of my other interviews during the trial. At least once, I had mentioned David doing hand motions over my face, hoping that someone outside would pick that up and investigate it more. On hmm. the stand, I was able to get away with saying truthfully that the abuse happened daily, although I was grilled by David's attorney. Hmm. Rosie was really mad because it made it look highly improbable that she had never seen these daily episodes. of Exactly. Abuse. So Rosalie Hamlin did not hold employment outside of the home. Did I skip or something? <laughs> Weird. She was present in the home while these daily episodes of abuse were going home. And yet nobody in the court and, and nobody in law enforcement thought to ask how in the world she managed over all of these years to see nothing. Mm -hmm. um, 72 years old. So she just got arrested. <laughs> why David Lee Hamlin was not prosecuted in 2003 corroboration. I think I skipped or something. Eliza Hamlin happened. tells the same story as her sister about the 1999 high council yeah. meeting that excommunicated her father, David Lee Hamlin. She names John Bunting as one of the men on the high council that excommunicated David Lee Hamlin. I looked for so him everywhere. give you a little more detail about John Bunting in a minute that's relevant um, that Isaiah uncovered uh, because it ties into the existing power structure of the church. But for now, we're going to stick with Eliza's victim statement. Okay. So this is the sisters. This, so this is, is the, the second, second oldest. The second statement about yeah, this. Second oldest child okay. of David and Roselle. I don't know what Peter or Famalia is. I did. attended a high council meeting with, with Rachel. We were blindfolded and driven a short distance when we were led into a basement and mm. told to wait until the council was ready. At that point, mm -mm. we were allowed to take our blindfolds off. When we entered the room, there were about 12 men in black hoods and robes sitting, in, sitting one of them was huh. Richard. The council members were sitting at the head of the room. The audience's seats were facing them in the back of the room. <laughs> Everyone either had a hood, mask, or veil covering his or her face. Um, <laughs> grandparents, include, family, including Richard, Karma, Suki, and Craig Christensen, were the only people with bare faces. The council started out by reprimanding David for failing in his responsibilities as a paterfamilias and for losing control of his wife and children. He had also failed in the proper teaching of the gospel to his children, and it contaminated the pure gospel with Native American theology. Oh, how dare him. They told him that he had gotten out of hand and sloppy in his observance of the gospel. That sounds like with Alex, you know, like he was just messing up left and right. <laughs> Honestly. They told him that he had gotten out of hand and sloppy in his observance of the gospel, and that he had built up a kingdom unto himself without the permission or approval of the council. His wife and children would be re reassigned to Richard hmm. as the new Pater Familius. The hell? Rosie was reprimanded for her behavior in the community, and both Rosie and David were told that they were not publicly devout enough in the LDS church. There you go. Okay. No. 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 Of the LDS church. That the was, Latter -day Saints. That was what one of the conditions is you have to be hidden. You have to you be have to not look seen. like so a weird. faithful Latter-day Saint. Is. That's because you're you have dual membership and you're blending in. One of the big things that they really this is how they stay hidden. This is one of the things that they really wanted to do is to profane the sacred and to blaspheme Heavenly Father That's by crazy. maintaining dual membership in these organizations. The reason she was reprimanded for her behavior is because during the divorce, before it was even finalized, <laughs> she was dating other men publicly. Um, she was going out there. Dates with you whore. Like <laughs> was a famous playwright within the LDS mm. and as that's not in keeping with what you would expect a faithful endowed member of the LDS to do, even if they're going through a divorce, they don't get to date until after the divorce is finalized. That's adultery. They certainly don't get to have sex, but you can have until they're you can have relations with children, your own, some of uh, children. It's not right. It's not my right married because that's a violation of the law of chastity. It's a violation. So Rosie Wait. was told that she would now be placed in a new home under the watchful eye of her parents, neighbors, and the council. She was admonished to be submissive and humble towards her parents in public and in private and to continue with the teachings of the unadulterated gospel. She was told that if she performed her duties well, her needs would be provided for. <laughs> My sisters and I were reprimanded for being disobedient, unruly, and not listening to the wise counsel of our elders. For these reasons, we would also be published or punished. 
We were told that our futures would be protected if we performed our duties well with humility and gratitude. Then they told us that Rosie and David would get a divorce and that Rachel and I would be allowed to testify against David for certain transgressions. Okay. They said they had a plan to use certain people in the community to ensure the council's plan would be cured, carried out. Right there. Right. It says that uh, we were told that our futures would be protected if we performed our duties well with humility and gratitude. Then they told us that Rosie and David would get a divorce and that the redacted and I would be allowed to testify against David for certain transgressions right here. They said that they had a plan to use certain people in the community to ensure the council's plan would be carried out. So do we, I mean, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. Things happen and and things judges rule one way. Uh, it's not always in the best of the eyes of the court. There's dirty people. They're they're corrupt. It just it, it bothers me. <laughs> I had to start stuttering and stuff. Do you certain people in the community testify against David for certain transgressions? They said they had a plan to use certain people in the community to ensure so it's not a damn conspiracy it's just dirt, carried out. Dirty. We would be advised about what language to use and which acts we could describe. Exactly. Exactly. Huh. We would be advised about what language to use and which acts we could describe. Like Rachel was strictly warned that this will be to the council's judgment would result in loss of position within the kingdom and the loss of our material possessions. If we performed our duties well, we would be provided a good life and many opportunities. At this point, the council ruled on our punishment, which was carried out immediately. Richard and Rosie, Richard and Rosie joined Rachel in a circle. Our whole family was forced to undress and participate in a covenant-making sexual act mm -hmm. where we submitted ourselves to Richard's will. After that, there was an orgy where my sisters and I were raped by many of the people there who were still masked. The only person whose face I did see was John Bunting from the LDS ward whose mask fell off during the orgy. He mm -hmm. was one of the men on the council. Right. Well, I think there's a lot to unpack here because there's a lot of graphic content in this but i think a lot of people are just wondering why 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 all of this is going this is a punishment of course for being sloppy and and it needed to be like a ritual type thing well, it's humiliation because david lee hamlin has been stripped of his role as the pater familius okay one of that? the things that they invoke is the wisdom of parents hmm. that's the parents know best for their children well, they suck and especially fathers, as the pater familius, know what's best for their family. So fathers have absolute authority mm. in their families. You have to comply with what they say because they're your elders. Until they don't. And that's the whole husband, priesthood. That's that whole priesthood flex thing, right? The dude, the, the man, the head of the family. Weird. That's for you. And no matter what it is, that Patriarchal. They, suggest, they have absolute power and domination <laughs> over you. So mm -hmm. stripping David Lee Hamlin of that role. <clears throat> And transferring it to his father-in-law Richard Lloyd Anderson, mm -mm. and making him watch while he raped David That's, Lee Hamlin's daughters, right? Um, and ejaculated on them, and then telling him, according to Rachel, "Lick it up and swallow it." Mm -mm. That's the ultimate form of humiliation for David Lee Hamlin. That's mm -hmm. why. It's also asserting dominance and establishing dominance for his daughters. That now you answer to your grandfather. But well, we're de dealing with someone who is so deviant that embarrassment, shame, all of those things, why wouldn't they be sexual perversions of themselves? Mm -hmm. How is the form of embarrassment here any different than the cruelty and abuse that they suffer? Why, right? in other words, why wouldn't that type of perversion be something that would be appealing to him? I could try to throw something in here, and I think it comes to what you said earlier. It's mm -hmm. about power. <clears throat> One is when he's doing it, he's in power. When what they're doing is is making them him subservient to them. Yes, Domin they're dominating Definitely. him. They're putting him in the places like an animal. Like totally. One of the reasons that he broke away and went down to Spring City to form a competing council mm -hmm. 
is because he was chafing Broke under off. the authority and oversight Article. of his father-in-law, Richard Lloyd Anderson. They, they did not like each other. So he wanted to go down to Spring City and work with Joe Binion hmm. away from the eyes of the people in Provo. And that way he could introduce his own particular doctrine, which was a mixture of the CS doctrine and also Native American theology. And I guess to go ahead and train train children to or train whatever his clients or whatever into thinking and liking what he liked because that's what he projected right that's what he was trying to do Ugh. in his studies robert hamlin Ugh. this was about and he's out on bail he's out on bail he's out on bail dominance and control from start to finish <laughs> and he, he would, did not want to wait until his time came when richard lloyd anderson and the old guard died out he wanted to exert total dominance in the present so <laughs> as much as this is sexual in nature it's really not even about power. the sexual acts it's more about the power and a, a, the control that you have over rape never is about sex or sexual pleasure it is about power and it is about asserting dominance over other people it's about overriding their consent and establishing that your will is sufficient mm -mm -mm. to override their consent. They don't have bodily autonomy. They can't say no to you because wow. you can physically dominate them and force them to do this. In the case of the CS, it's not about sex in the typical sense. You know, sure, surely they enjoy it from a power standpoint. And also the women who are forcing their daughters and sons to do it, they get off on it. But ultimately, mm -hmm. they're also have the purpose of training their children to become the types of adults who will perpetrate this abuse on their grandchildren. Exactly. And -grandchildren Generational. To come. The, you know, this is about perpetrating. Infiltrating each generation. Also perpetuating the group into the future. I think it's just hard for most sane people to get their minds around. I think it's, that's what it comes down to. It's just, I guess maybe except for those that has happened to, and then you're like, Oh, okay. I understand it a little more. I don't understand. You know, I don't condone it. I, I'm totally against it. It happened to me. But you kind of start to understand the the infrastructure or whatever. A sane person has a hard time wrapping their heads around this, which is why there'll be a lot of cognitive dissidents and why a lot of people will have a very hard time with this. Mm -hmm. People are going to have a hard time with this. It's yeah, the maybe. average person is going to be upset that we're doing this and exposing it just mm -hmm. because it's 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 offensive it's hard it's heavy it's it's easier to run away from it to just put it in a corner and say it's and 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 not take responsibility because there is a weight of responsibility that comes with this because when you take this you're, when you take this information out and and absorb it you leave neutral ground you can no longer say you're ignorant to the evil exactly now you know the evil is there and you have a responsibility to either do something without the evil or close your eyes and allow the dragon to grow and you can't That's why people would, would rather most people would rather deny this Push it away because they don't want the responsibility that comes with it. Same thing. And then I don't understand how they'll, there's so many people that will <clears throat> uh, defend the offenders. It's just crazy. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> with principles of freedom. It's, well, the it issue comes with is, is like Latter day Saints don't understand, I think, culturally because we are taught to be so deferential. Because they're trained that way. To authority, we assume that authority will do. We assume that God's anointed leaders or the law deal with this or the, or the, the legal law. system will deal yeah. with it. And the reality of it is we each have obligations. We swear covenants. That and they have the whole, you know, we know people that will uh, handle and navigate this criminal process, you know? Ugh. That we will not look away from evil, but that we will confront it. And what I would say to anybody out there watching who's having a hard time with this, it's your job yeah. as a Latter day Saint, as a, as a job as anybody, church. not even a member of the church, it is a job uh -huh. as, a, as a human being. And I try to always put in there, you know, just to they, imagine what the victim went through. Um, okay. And so they went through the ultimate betrayal. Their blood was spilt for this. Um, those that don't live to tell. And this is their stories. This, these are their stories. And, and there, you know, it's, it's, 
it's gross and it's hard, but it's not because they lived or, you know, became um, innocent again. You know, their innocence was taken. It was robbed. So. Ugh. This is not about the church. This is about, this is about into human being beings human. who know this type of stuff's going on. These girls statements, if these, if these things are true, mm -hmm. I don't care what religion you are. You have a response, God given responsibility to stand for truth, stand for right and to protect Katie Hamlin's victim statement tells the same story. She and her sisters were brought in before the CS council and they witnessed their father's excommunication. The council instructed them and their parents on how to proceed with the divorce and what would be permitted in the divorce. An orgy <laughs> followed. Katie Hamlin named Joy and Gary Lund Lundberg. Gary and that's, Bonnie That's Hansen. the ones who are in eastidahonews.com. Anson and John Bunting as well. So we've got two children. John Bunting is still a, um, he still holds a calling in, in his ward. Who named John Bunting. Um, we've got corroboration there. Now, who is John Allen Bunting? He is John Allen Bunting of the Provo, Utah Edgemont Stake. He was the stake president hmm. from May uh, 21st, 2016 onward. He succeeded Lowell James Robeson, uh, previously of the Edgemont 7th Ward. Robeson was released from a stake presidency by Merrill J. Bateman after a second individual came forward to accuse Robeson of sexual abuse. The first now this one, I don't know. I've never heard of and, but he did a Mormon stories podcast interview. Um, of the victim, I want to say first individual was Robeson's cousin, Christopher swallow, who accused him in 1995 of abuse. Swallow reported Robeson and Earl C. Tingey and warned Tingey that Robeson was a sexual predator. And the church had called him as a mission president of the Mexico Leon mission. The church didn't remove him from the calling. They let him go. After Swallow appears in Mormon stories, yeah. um, what, how long ago was it? 2017. Okay. He deleted himself. Okay. Robeson was replaced as a stake president in Provo Edgemont, Utah State by John Allen Bunting, who was himself accused of being present and participating in an orgy where the Hamlin children were raped, <clears throat> where he raped at least That's one of terrible. those children himself. Um. So when we talk about John mm -hmm. Allen Bunting, he's a former stake president, Provo Edgemont Stake. He's the managing director of Facet Precision Tool GmbH. He's the former CEO of Precor. He's an alleged member of the High Council for the Church of Satan in Provo. <laughs> and he allegedly orally sodomized Katie Hamblin in 1999 at the CS High Council excommunication of her father, David Lee Hamblin. Now, to further crazy. highlight the significance of family and business connections, I'd like to detail a little more on alleged CSI council member John A. Bunting. Professionally, in 1979, he joined founders Dr. Bill J. Pope and Lewis Pope, a father and son partnership at their newly formed research and development company, U.S. Synthetic. Hmm. Now, U.S. Synthetic specialization was drilling industry technology, and they went on to become a huge player in the industry. Wow. So... Elite. Now deceased Bill J. Pope was the husband of the former Margaret McConkie, the sister of <laughs> LDS apostle Bruce R. McConkie and Oscar W. McConkie. And then there's that whole David McConkie who is charged with doing the same thing with, you know, incestuous affairs. Oscar was one of the founding partners of the LDS Church's main law firm, Kurt McConkie. <clears throat> so the ties don't end there. One of Bill and Margaret Pope's daughters, Catherine, is currently married to David Paxman the eldest son of Judge Monroe and Shirley Brockbank Paxman, individuals named by David Lee Hamlin's daughters in their victim statements. <laughs> Shirley Brockbank Paxman was the cousin of Mary June Adams Hamlin, David Lee Hamlin's mother. Bam. He also owned uh, a venue called the McCurdy Doll Museum. It was all of these. Oh, yeah, we did go over this. I'm sorry. The collection, and the CS was allegedly allowed to use that venue for their ceremonies where they would rape children in the McCurdy Doll Museum. With dolls. The Paxmans also had a retreat, like a cabin out at Wildwood, where the Hamlin's family also had one. And mm -hmm. so they were tied into the same neighborhoods, the same, the same network. And of course, it goes back to John Bunting, who's also partners with Dr. <laughs> Bill J. Pope and yeah, Louis Pope. 
That's horrible. And Bill J. Pope is the husband of <laughs> Margaret you. McConkey. And Oscar, like uh, her brother-in-law, is he's one of the founding partners of Curtin McConkey. And they so cover the ties it just keep unfolding in front of us over and over and over again to show you how connected and plugged in these people are. And Very. I mean, so we're, we're talking about things back in the 90s and early 2000s, but that was during the satanic panic law firm Not McCockey yeah today. yeah and so when you're looking at it and in that context you start to see why it's so difficult to hold these people to account mm -hmm. because what's your instinct going to be if like your brother or your business associate is accused of this and maybe you're not culpable in it you don't participate in it yourself your instinct is going to be to defend them why <laughs> not mine he's going to be to say no I, I i know this person it's not going to be to acknowledge the possibility that this person operated right under your nose for decades involved in this kind of activity okay, Gary. so it doesn't necessarily have to be that these individuals are members of the cs but they you enable it your friends <laughs> you defend your family members especially from allegations of scurrilous so there's that possible explanation i'm not saying that the mcconkeys have to be church of state members i would be the first one to tell you i don't have direct evidence in the form of allegations against either bruce or lewis mcconkey i don't i don't have that like i do i would be the no, first I one to say that to be fair <clears throat> and i do have those allegations against john allen bunting and i do have a connection with john allen bunting to the men who would be connected to Kurt who is the guy in, in colorado city that I just was, got arrested I was just that's George, no, David McConkey. The guy who got arrested in hey, Lily. Colorado City. This just came out David like two George weeks McConkey. ago. David George McConkey. He for, got arrested. He yeah, got arrested okay. for sexually <laughs> abusing a relative for nine years. Yeah. And I'm sure it's because okay. they uh, haunted him. And that's, that's the, <laughs> it's the grandson of Bruce R. McConkey. Was just arrested. This was in the news yeah. in Colorado, Colorado City. City. For sexually abusing, sexually abusing <laughs> children for nine years. No, sexually abusing a child that a he child. was related to for One nine child. years. We don't have the specifics. I mean, obviously, they're he not going to publicize the victim's attorney. name or who the victim is um, because it is an active criminal case. But he was arrested for that, and he's related to the McConkeys. That does weigh against them. However, it does not constitute a direct allegation against Correct. them. Correct. It just means that someone in their family was accused of it and is facing a criminal case uh, because of that. But in the larger context, it does not look good. No, I don't. Um, because one of the things that I said earlier to you, 93% of childhood abuse victims know their abuser. It's not a stranger. It's a member of their family or an associate of the family, someone who's known to the family. And when you start looking at victims and abusers, what you'll see in the family trees is the presence of people who have been accused of abuse or who have been convicted of abuse, people who are on sex offender registries. I think so, this would be a really opportune time for some of these people who, if this has been going on in their families and they're not a part of it, to come come forward and help clean it up rather than allow it to go quiet exactly. because they don't want to implicate a family member. Other, I mean, this, I, I just think that needs to happen. And I have a feeling it will happen. And I'll go a step further. If something like this has happened to you or someone close to you, you should feel safe that it's a good time to come out now. Yeah. If this has been happening in your life or something that you've witnessed. This stuff needs to come out. This needs if, to come how, out. We, if you want to stop other abuse, it has to come out. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Yes. You know? Yes, it is. And so another named accomplice in those victim statements is Gary and Joy Lundberg. That's the one. Gary that... Lundberg is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Utah. Okay. He... So they're licensed family therapists or she, he is Gary Lundberg is a licensed marriage and family therapist. That's the one who he and his wife have a bunch of books out there um, on marriages and you know, marriage counseling. And they have a, article with East Idaho News uh, from 2015 about how to, you know, handle marriage with a blended, how to handle a blended family and marriage, you know, and it's just crazy because you think about how, if you just came across that article, 
okay, it looks great, you know, but then you see like the things that these people could allegedly be a part of. And you're like, Oh my God, it's right there in our faces. Was allegedly present at the 1999 high council excommunication of David Lee Hamlin. Joy Lundberg's mask allegedly fell off during the orgy at the close of the high council's meeting. Katie Hamlin alleged that Gary and Joy were present during a church of Satan ceiling at Richard Lloyd Anderson and Karma Anderson's Provo condo and that she and her sisters were forced to perform mm -hmm. oral sex on both Gary and Joy. So this is Gary and Joy Lundberg. These are alleged Church of Satan members, alleged sexual abusers of the Hamlin children. The Lundbergs are co-authors of various books on marriage. And Joy is a lyricist with over 170 songs to her credit with composer Janice Cap Perry. Huh. And so he had said to me a while back that a lot of these people are going to be in the in the music and arts and uh, i just think that's interesting because like Lori and chad's their their whole and i'm saying alleged because I, I don't know how this works yet <clears throat> but their whole thing was that they were in charge of healing y'all remember that and and there was music in there too um oh i'm trying to remember so in the greater scheme of things, these are credible Latter-day Saints. These are experts on marriage from a Latter-day Saint perspective, but they're alleged to have held membership in this organization mm -hmm. and to have abused children at the same time. And, and have children like and grandchildren. Standard, nice grandma, grandpa. This is mm -hmm. just where it's, it's very hard to like believe it. Mm -hmm. I'll be yeah. honest. It's very hard to believe that you look at these people. It's very hard to believe. It's hard to see straight. it. You know, it would be extremely you're not looking hard for to it. believe it unless they were directly targeting. It. So they're going to come across as grandfatherly and grandmotherly and, and really nice. And, and that's why I think ML Elder Ballard in the room. I mean, uh, Russell M. Ballard. I think that's why his name comes up in here so long. And it's, it's disturbing to know that he's in charge of like, he loves all God's children and he's here to point them to the Lord. That's freaky pedophile or no. sexual abuse i have <laughs> and what i would say to you is at least initially like they look and sound like a regular nice person and it's only when you chip away at their aura you confront them with like really hard facts that that starts to wear away and they start to get defensive and then mm -hmm. they start to articulate their perspective on it where they don't even believe it's abuse they you believe it's oh yeah their version of love for a child. Bam, there's Jody, y'all. <laughs> that's what I see. I, I, do y'all see it too? So that's how these people contextualize things and they compartmentalize things in a way that normal people don't. And that's how they're able to maintain the facade. One oh, that, yeah. That really stuck out to me in some of the victim statements mm -hmm. was common throughout all of And Mike Stroud. Was, um, from a very young age. You mentioned Mike Stroud too. Would, te would uh, teach them to switch personalities that she the mother would come in and just absolutely terrify the fun. kids terrify them till they were like just yeah just, i mean terrified to, to i mean and did, did did things that would i understand terrify him and then a second later she'd be their best friend and sweet and cuddly and kind and come sit in my lap and then boom switch right back it's in. called the scaring game right the scaring game they called it Speaking of games. what i noticed <laughs> is then they would get the kids to do it to each other and what i what i see is it teaches kids and a year it ingrains and then be able to switch personalities to now I'm playing the religious. The and it's the only way for a child to learn is if you introduce it. So when, when Ruby, when that estate, that statement came out or whatever about her saying, well, at first you have Jody saying, um, you know, those two kids don't need to be around any other kids. Okay. Why? Because they're not in a controlled element in your laboratory, you know, under your direction where you're training them and you're training, let's say she's training R to be a sexual deviant and to take over dominion of his sister and his sisters and his mother. Okay. And so, and then you have the kid actually saying, you know, it's all my fault. And then that happened also with Jesse, you know, how they were saying that, um, you know, Jody would force Jesse to go to other clients' houses and they would have to say um, exactly what Jody, 
had told them to say or else what's going on and how do we freaking what it's nuts i don't know how to how do we get to the bottom of it besides doing what we're doing i guess kind and i can get into that role and be very convincing and then a second later i can be the most terrorizing person in the world and that was something that i that fascinated me as i was reading through there yeah, and i think that's the only thing that helps me i had read a long time ago that it's like and i mean i don't know this is just looking at it in a generalized sense like how there's so much triggering things on on tv to watch you know and how it's hard uh, even for like true crime people in the true crime genre and things that are just horrible we've read about things that are horrible and demented and evil and demonic i mean just the horrible the grossest of the grossest right the worst of the worst and it's like as a society is what they were talking about how we are being subjected to more and more um triggering uh content you more graphic content like what we're doing right here this is graphic this is hard this is hard to do um, but some people, this is nothing to them. You know, it's like they're desensitized to it. So it's like uh, as public um, at large or whatever, it's like in a way we're also being subjected to the dissociative disorder thing, you know, like because it just it's worse and worse and worse and more and more and more and more. And I don't know. It makes sense of some of these people who that right, I'm sure. me, I, um, I have a hard time wrapping here. my mind around it. I honestly do. So if I get kicked out, I'm coming back. Things that you have to understand about early childhood development is there have been studies done, and you can watch videos on the internet of this where it's like a newborn, and the newborn's mother is interacting with him and looking him in the face and like talking to him, cooing, cooing at him as a mother does. But then, as part of the yes. study, the mother turns around and looks away. Right. And doesn't pay any attention to the, the child at all. And the child's face like nature gradually gets confused nature. and contorted. Is looking trying for to get mama. the mom's attention. But the mother isn't giving that child the attention. That is elemental to that child's healthy well being and psychological development at that stage of their lives. Like facial expressions and whatnot. You have to understand, David Lee Hamlin and Clyde Everett Sullivan, my computer just glitched. One of his own. <laughs> I wonder if it's my monitor. Um, were both trained psychologists. They would have been aware of this. Oh, crap. The methodology just didn't do. So Krisha said she was coming back. So I guess we we'll should give her uh, a chance to do that. Y'all can hear me, can't you? That is some deep, deep uh, information that we're going through here. And uh, you do need to be careful with your, your mental health on these things too, because it's like she said, you know, uh, we're not we don't want to get desensitized to it but at the same time you can't stay triggered all the time so you do have to be careful and uh and i believe that one of the people in our uh, chat was saying that a good way to do that is to uh do some textile type uh craft or something while you're listening to these things that maybe you could do some cross stitch or embroidery or knit or crochet or something like that and that way your brain is got something else that's going on that is a little more relaxing and familiar i'm sure krish is going to try to come right back in 
so we're going to wait. She may be having to restart her computer and everything. And, uh, and it is a ton of stuff that seems like that it's going on. And and I, I, I really should start doing clips from all the different places. I mean, all the different channels and news and stuff. And they'll be telling these things about... Uh, Tim Ballard and Jody and all that, and they'll repeatedly say, this sure sounds like Lori and Chad Daybell. This sure sounds familiar. The You know, it just gets all added together. And, you know, I guess they're all in the same culture. There should be things that are the same. But the things that we're finding that are the same are not good things. And so I'm going to see here what Chris is doing. See if maybe I can text her. See if she's coming back in. I think she was said she was said, if she said if I get kicked out, I'm coming back in. I'm sure she is. So much coming up. We've got Arizona coming up. We've got Arizona coming up. And I don't see how that's going to happen before next year. Even they said it would be before the end of the year. I mean, if they got her over there now, if they took her over there now and started having these things, they couldn't be ready before the beginning of the year. I don't even want to think about this, y'all, but let's see. It's the middle of October. Well, dang, it'll be Thanksgiving and Christmas before all that comes around. Good to see you, S.L. Conley. I'm going to read some of these comments while we're waiting on Crescia. I should probably go back up this way. Ah, I'm here, y'all. I haven't went away. Y'all hang in with us just a little bit longer. Uh, and we may have to, like, come back. I, you know, it may be that her power went out or something, and she can't get back. Because I have been in a live stream before when the person's uh, electricity went out. And uh, I think I talked for about an hour waiting for them to come back. So we won't do that. Because uh, this stream, it, we've been, let's see, we've been almost two hours. And uh, I 
I know she was in a place that she wanted to come back to. So I guess we could hang out here for a while yet. <sighs> and uh, but what we might do if Grisha doesn't come back in a few minutes, we may just end this live and let her uh, open a new one up in a couple of days because this is good this is really deep it's really going to take some time i mean this guy's been working on it for eight years we're not likely to be able to tell you all what happened in two hours and these things have been going on it looks like pretty steady the man's wife just got arrested this uh david hamlin's wife our ex-wife at this point that took part in all these things she was 72 and she got uh, arrested recently i think but he's still out of jail terrible 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 man all right i don't even know how long it we may have waited long enough. Okay. I'm going to say that we can end this. Let's see. What is tomorrow? And we'll come back Friday night. So that's, I shouldn't make a plan like that. But I do think she will want to come back and, uh, and continue with this right away but maybe not tomorrow we will come back friday she may have the service for her uncle on friday too so i will just have to let her um put up the notification and you'll see it when it comes out and so what we'll do is um So think of that I. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, justice for Tylee, JJ, Charles, Tammy, Joe, all of these people that this Hamlin guy was mean and bad to and molested and carried on. And also Jody and not Jody, but uh, Ruby's kids and all of Jody's victims. Justice for them all. Love always wins. And Kresha K will, uh, will set up a notification and we'll do it again next time. Love always wins.